so much to say and um, not much time to say it in. Um, a preamble, then a cut to the chase. I mean, the preamble uh, is that uh, it's inescapable. We are living um, in a, a civil war. It is a civil war. Um, the country is um, um, divided, profoundly divided. Everyone knows that. And on the one hand, um, there are those of us who um, believe in um, openness, uh, an international architecture um, in Europe of which we're part. Um, uh, uh, we're prepared to accept a 21st century version of shared sovereignty. We understand contemporary inter interdependencies and embrace them. Uh, and against which is a kind of 19th century conception of um, the primacy of the nation state uh, and all that goes with it. And uh, uh, finding a way through this um, requires, uh, is going to require, um, in my view, at the, a second referendum. Um, I hope that's going to happen in the next six months, but I mean, uh, I was much more hopeful about that um, um, three weeks ago than I am now. Um, I think that the, um, I think the Lexeters um, round Jeremy Corbyn, including the chair of the party, Ian Lavery, Corbyn himself, his kitchen cabinet, and around 30 or 40 Labour MPs um, who are fearful of their seats in the north of England and the Midlands um, are a, kind of a roadblock to the vast majority of the members of the Labour Party um, kind of pushing for the referendum that would have been the cornerstone on which Dominic Grieve believes he could have de delivered up to 50 Tories which along with the SNP and the Liberal Democrats would have had a narrow majority um, in favor of a referendum. Um, and you have this extraordinary phenomena of um, uh, um, the Labour front bench um, fractured um, because a number of them do not agree um, with the line that the leadership are taking, um, kind of colluding in um, uh, a Brexit which is driven by um, the need by Mrs. May to hold her party together. Um, a leading Tory um, tells me that you, to understand Mrs. May, you must understand that um, every Saturday morning for the last 40 years, she has pushed uh, um, leaflets advertising the Tory party through letterboxes um, in whatever constituency she's been trying to win or hold. Um, at a recent cabinet meeting, um, rather than discuss uh, how to move the whole thing forward, and was finally um, brought to a close by a number of her fellow cabinet ministers, she insisted on reading out um, um, letters of support from chairs of conservative constituency party associations. And she had to be reminded by another of the cabinet that this was a matter of national importance and not one uh, about the Tory party. But understand her mindset and her implacable opposition to a referendum is because um, if the referendum was held and it was won, um, it would, of course, lead to the fissure in the Tory party that we can all see opening up into a split, uh, which she regards as so profound against the national interest that she would even keep the prospect of uh, a no deal kind of on the table right to the end and even do it. Nobody should be under any mistake uh, uh, apprehension, mistaken apprehension. Mrs. May puts the integrity, cohesion, and uh, of the Tory party um, before the consequences of a hard Brexit. Um, how do we get to this pass? Um, it's, uh, it, um, I think everyone knows um, the kind of um, story over 40 years, um, the unresolved nature of Britain's membership of the European Union, we can discuss that. But actually, um, looking at the referendum um, vote itself, um, uh, and talking a little bit about the state of Britain, um, when I wrote the opening chapter um, to Saving Britain, um, having written the state we're in and kind of been a regular columnist for years, I thought I knew um, a bit about contemporary Britain. And I was really shaken um, by um, the numbers that um, are there for us all to read. So for example, seven of the poorest northern regions 
in Northern Europe are in England, with per capita incomes um, lower than uh, Mississippi, the poorest state in the United States, and lower than Romania and Bulgaria. That's our country, folks. Um, life expectancy in the Northeast, the Northwest, Yorkshire and Humberside, the East and West Midlands, all of whom were Brexit voting regions, fell, um, uh, according to Public Health England, um, between 2014 and 2016. 30 social mobility cold spots identified by um, the um, Social Mobility Commission at the time, 2017, headed up by Alan Milburn, who resigned over the lack of, kind of traction um, his reports were getting on government. Those 30 social mobility cold spots um, defined as areas where literally um, you, are, um, you don't either move out and you don't move up, um, but you're um, stuck. There are areas like um, Weymouth, a lot of coastal cities like that, Grimsby. Um, there are also um, old mining towns like Mansfield. Um, there are also um, kind of, um, towns uh, in the shadow of a larger town, Birkenhead in the shadow of Liverpool, Bradford in the shadow um, of um, Leeds, um, Rotherham in the shadow of Sheffield. These are social mobility goal spots. All of them voted Brexit. Um, in Blackpool, um, um, which voted Brexit um, by 71%, um, the uh, adult population um, are 331 per thousand people in Blackpool are on antidepressants. For reference, someone like Brent in London, the figure is 50. Um, the, uh, I can uh, uh, go on. I, uh, the, the sales of, um, in mind, just an anecdote, um, in Oxford, um, buying the newspapers one morning, um, I, I encountered three people in the queue ahead of me um, who were all conferring with each other and about to vote leave. And uh, I thought doing a bit of campaigning. And the reason why all three um, were going to vote leave was because um, there was no national health dentistry in Oxford. And apart from thinking it was a ludicrous reason to vote leave, which I said, you know. Uh, but, 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 uh, again, writing this book, um, the growth of DIY dental kits, where you self-administer um, a fill uh, the anesthetic and self-administer the filling, are again booming in Britain because we don't have uh, a national dental service. And you can map um, the growth of sales of DIY dental kits onto the Brexit vote. So uh, everyone knows the story about um, you know, our times. Data capitalism has thrown up kind of virtuous circle effects where people like us um, who have degrees uh, are cognitively kind of able. Um, one way or another, um, the system works for us. Um, and there's lots of opportunities for us. And uh, all those parts of the country, the university towns, voted broadly and remain. But the large parts of the country um, which weren't like that, um, the towns I've described, um, coastal cities, smaller towns, um, did not. Um, Mansfield, um, an old mining town, 12 miles away from Nottingham, uh, only 0.7% of the jobs, 0.7% of the jobs in Mansfield are in so-called kind of knowledge, economy, cognitive kind of skill forms of employment in the private sector. Um, if you look at, the, look at the amount of traffic, commuter traffic, and just trade between Mansfield and Nottingham, 12 miles south, it's almost non-existent. Mansfield is an urban island a mining town kind of going down uh, where its um, inhabitants know damn well that globalization, automation, and current trends have got nothing for it. Its wages are 20% below the national average, kind of unemployment well above the national average. Was it a surprise it votes for Brexit?
and Nottingham, of course, is more finely balanced, a narrow margin in favour of Remain. And that's the so you know when people talk about why we're in the situation, um, the working population still managed, by the way, to break 51-49 um, in favour of Remain. Um, what took us out um, was the huge majorities of the over 65s. And you have this kind of amazing coalition between the over 65s and the people I've just described um, uh, uh, and the people I've just described of kind of working age in those kind of in those kind of communities. That's what took us out. And they, of course, are disproportionate readers of the centre right um, right wing press. Um, it's conspicuous that Liverpool, uh, where the sun is still not distributed. Um, Kind of in 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 the, in the wake of the kind of um, football tragedy, um, uh, you know, 57% voted Remain. You know, whereas Birkenhead, kind of uh, across the Mersey, where you can still buy the Sun, it's going to 65% voted Leave. So these kind of this is um, this division uh, is 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 right around, and actually it does map onto um, the English Civil War uh, when. Kind of all those areas that I've described were for um, the king uh, and the kind of larger cities, in particular London, uh, which were remain, were all for Parliament. And um, as I as I kind of as I say to Caroline Flint, who represents the Don Valley in Yorkshire, that when she says, you know, I must listen to her constituents, I say, well, you know, would you have said that? in the autumn of 1643, when they were all fighting for the crown, and people like me who are for parliament would have been written off as members of the liberal London elite. Who was right, who was wrong? And I, I, so I'm very, very tough on this. Um, when people say that a second referendum might be divisive, um, my, my, my reply is the division sits there in front of us. Do you think that um, uh, Mrs. May's deal, um, and which will be, if it goes through the House of Commons, if they manage to, we'll discuss it in a minute, will sit as a superating, scabrous sore uh, in the heart of British politics for the next decade? Um, the, um, it, won't be good, it won't be good enough um, for Remainers like me, and the, and the Brexiters will want to unpack it and go for the uh, negotiated, as they will describe it, hard Brexit. And uh, this division um, isn't going to get less, it's going to get more intense. And, you know, people like Ian Lavery and, Ma and Theresa May making common cause. Um, the, left, the leftist Ian Lavery makes common cause with Theresa May, refusing to kind of confront this, uh, or in my view, stand by the values um, of the European Enlightenment, uh, or indeed what I think um, the liberal left and indeed the liberal conservative kind of uh, wing in our society should stand for. On the substance of the matter, uh, kind of the, um, we must have a hard Brexit because we must recover control of our laws, our money, and our borders. Um, I just want to say a few words about this and then kind of, uh, kind of point to kind of how one might win this argument in the what I think is likely to be, unfortunately, the years ahead. Um, the idea that, um, that uh, a hard Brexit, uh, or, or even actually a kind of um, the soft Brexit of her deal, um, is going to deliver um, m more rapid economic growth, um, and, um, uh, and to, which together with the savings of our contributions to Brussels, uh, is going to kind of lead to kind of broad sunlit uplands, economic uplands, um, depends upon depends upon the assumption that Britain can have an independent trade policy, which will um, lead to more exposure to um, uh, kind of exporting possibilities um, than um, what we currently have in the European Union. Now, there are 27 member states in the European Union, but once we've left, and it has um, trade agreements with 30 countries and 31 in train. 30 plus 31 plus 27 sums to 88. There are 162 members of the World Trade Organization. Thus, uh, and the World Trade Organization is, as you all know, falling apart. Its appellate body, um, which adjudicates disputes, requires there to be a number of judges, one of whom written into the statutes is, uh, must be an American, one has to be European, one has to be Chinese, 
Um, but Trump has said he's not going to appoint a replacement judge. And that means the, the appellate body in the World Trade Organization <laughs> actually ceases to be legitimate within its own constitution. And actually the WTO thus becomes unable um, to adjudicate in trade disputes. Um, it can't even enforce its adjudication anyway. It becomes actually a complete cipher, a complete cipher. Moreover, the World Trade Organization has um, no jurisdiction over services or non-tariff barriers to trade, about which I'm going to say a little bit in a minute. Non-tariff barriers to trade, uh, health standards, safety standards, product standards, design standards, um, a, a kind of, uh, are you allowed, are you can, can you buy this drug um, in XYZ country? Um, has it got the right composition? Will it make you ill? Will it not? All those kinds of questions are four times more costly than a tariff. Irish tariffs are around 5%. Non-tariff barriers to trade are about 20 now, the single market um, is aimed at, at harmonizing these non-tariff barriers to trade. And it's been fantastic for Britain's service sector, which isn't only um, the financial services uh, or business services. It's also the creative industries. Music, the famous letter that Bono wrote about you know, what it was going to do to kind of the British rock and roll industry, or actually the British synth the, our strength in, in, in classical music. Um, it's architecture. All these areas, we've done really well selling into the European Union, partly compensating for our enormous trade deficit in goods. Our trade deficit in goods in 2018 is around 150 billion pounds. We have a surplus in services of about 70 billion, so the current account deficit is about 80 billion. Um, and we ha and strategically. It's crucial, if we're going to have any chance of paying our way in the world, that we have access to the service markets. A hard Brexit and even the negotiated trade, free trade agreement that May wants to kind of try and negotiate with the European Union won't include services. So we're going to, uh, and it's for us in universities about um, getting access to kind of um, um, EU students and EU research monies. Um, it's about the access of architects, lawyers, accountants. I mean, the industries and the sectors uh, in which this country is comparatively strong will be devastated by a hard Brexit. Nor will the World Trade Organization adjudicate, uh, nor will there be the only three countries that can compensate for the loss of the 88 countries with whom we currently either do directly or indirectly through the free trade agreements that the Europeans have got that will compensate for the, are the United States, China, and India. Make America Great Again Trump is absolutely not in the business of actually signing a great free trade deal with Britain in services. It's going to have us for breakfast in any way. The Constitution of the United States, and we'll even a free trade to go through if the US Senate says yes, and the US Senate will only say yes because it's disproportionately made of agrarian states if they get access to kind of all the um, genetically modified food that is generated in the states. China, um, President Xi is committed to autarky in China, autarky. Um, they're even closing down markets for New Zealand milk in China, even though this is not a country which has got much kind of, only 8% of the land area of China is actually capable of actually supporting dairy farming. But they don't want to import milk even. And they're certainly, prepared to they're certainly interested in kind of importing uh, any of our legal, financial, and business services. Um, uh, and the row over Huawei can give you some sense of where they are at. Um, anyway, they're, 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 um, um, China 2025, which is Xi's kind of flagship project, is about actually n closing down China to foreign imports, not opening it up. India, similarly. There is zero chance, zero chance, of um, these countries opening to compensate for what we're losing. And actually, by the way, the European Union anchors the world trading system. Its uh, customs union, its single market, and the free trade agreements it has is the anchor of the trade system. So to talk about kind of global Britain, uh, uh, in the context of this reality is to talk total nonsense, complete fantasy.
is a 19th century backward-looking fantasy, which you would only want to do if you're Boris Johnson, because as, his, uh, as the man who advised him in the um, first term in office, uh, Mangita Harry, uh, told me confidentially, um, the only reason that Boris swung into the leave camp, the only reason he did it, the chief reason he did it, was because he wanted to knock Osborne out of the succession in 2019 to David Cameron. And he thought if he could, if he could um, run leave, run Cameron close, he had no conception of winning, he'd set himself up with Conservative Party constituency associations um, to, be, to beat George Osborne in the runoff that he confidently expected in 2019. That's why he did it. So we're, we're, we're trashing uh, our, our trading position and the growth prospects that, that derive from it because Boris wanted to be Prime Minister. And the con corrupt Conservative Party uh, and the corruption of a first-past-the-post voting system and the empowerment there is for Conservative Party constituency associations allowed effectively the politics of an, of an Oxford or Cambridge College's junior common room to be the kind of politics that a great state like we are um, got configured politically. Um, so uh, there's no chance of an, of an independent trade policy doing, and one of the things that enrages me um, is when I hear BBC interviewers not challenging these Brexiters when they mouth off about an independent trade policy is going to deliver all these wonderful things. Um, control of our, um, control of our uh, money um, and control of our borders, uh, again, uh, the big point about the European Union was that these non-tariff barriers to trade and the and the and the and the and the and the, ta and the, and the common standards that have emerged in in Europe, we were the global standard setter. Between 2009 and 2016, 86 percent, 86 percent of the rules on um, car. Um, uh, drugs on carbon dioxide emissions, noxes, NOx emissions from diesel engines, uh, the data provisions um, came out of London. We were the global standard setter via the European Union. Of course we had to negotiate it, and of course all those standards had to be passed by every um, parliament in the European Union, and the European Parliament had to say yes, in a fundamental democratic process that spanned our continent. It was absolutely extraordinary and rather wonderful. And brilliant companies like Vodafone were able to use a British standard, flip it into an EU standard, became a global standard. One pound of every eight pound of dividends in London stock market is paid by Vodafone. Part of my pension were paid by Vodafone because of my membership of the European Union. There's not going to be a second Vodafone in the world that's designed by the right of the Tory party. Um, so, this democratic process by which we set our laws was a, was a 21st century mechanism for sharing sovereignty in a democratic um, formula, um, not actually them being imposed from Brussels. We co-designed and co-authored these laws. And um, it's true that um, freedom of movement um, led to big surge um, in immigration. And there's no question that actually um, immigration um, well, and the events of 2015 in particular, and um, with Angela Merkel taking her million immigrants from Syria. By the way, um, we learn now that actually they're incredibly high skilled. The vast proportion of them are um, either uh, got the degrees or have achieved degree status um, in Germany. And actually, um, the number of incidents of kind of uh, um, these immigrants doing the noxious things that allegedly Nigel Farage said they were going to do, it doesn't, hasn't happened. And actually we're watching something rather miraculous taking place in Germany, <coughs> which is the integration and assimilation of a thousand Syrians, of a million Syrians. But back to the, back to the point, there's no doubt that that, that that and the threat of the same thing happening from Turkey and uh, uh, places like Boston and Lincolnshire um, 20 of the 23 front pages of the Daily Mail 
before the before the referendum on June the 23rd were had were consecrated to the immigration threat. Boston is coming to you. And Paul Dacre kept saying in the Daily Mail. Um, and actually, um, credulous readers and um, a substantive part of, kind of white van driving Britain kind of bought that. Um, immigration, if you did say, however, even to a panel of UKIP voters, if you did say to them, you put the proposition, which some of you might not like, but nonetheless it's an interesting proposition to put to them, um, it's not immigrants that shape Britain, it's the British that shape our immigrants. Even their degree of anti-immigrant sentiment in UKIP voters halved. But the, this, this kind of argument about, you know, we need these people, they're great people to have, um, they integrate, they assimilate, um, and by the way, um, there are mechanisms for controlling the flow, their, their flow within the current protocols of the European Union. We're not made. And um, they, they weren't made because um, kind of there was this kind of a poverty of courage amongst our political leaders, particularly on the liberal left, um, who wouldn't say it. Nor was there, I mean, there were attempts um, to kind of, uh, Gordon Brown set up before he left office, an anti a kind of migrant kind of hotspot kind of alleviation fund where parts of the country would be eligible for up to 40 million, the fund was only 40 million pounds in size, but if there were pinch points, this fund was, of course it was scrapped. The very, one of the first things, along with abolition of the, of the Child Trust Fund that the incoming coalition government did in kind of <coughs> June 2010, was to scrap it. So that the capacity to help Boston kind of have more school capacity, have more hospitals, have more doctors, was eliminated. Um, by um, the launch of austerity, which, by the way, in a place like Blackpool, the cumulative impact of the social spending cuts in Blackpool was £1,030 per head between 2010 and 2016. So, that, you know, Osborne and Cameron's austerity project, um, lowering um, Britain's budget deficit entirely, uh, entirely by looking for public expenditure cuts, which were disproportionately heavy um, in areas of social spending, um, is another proximate cause and kind of, of the vote. So put that cocktail together, and we had what we had with the evil political genius um, of Nigel Farage, um, in fact, um, uh, uh, playing to um, the same kinds of instincts that in Britain um, Enoch Powell had played to um, in his River of Blood speech, uh, but never actually making the same mistake as Enoch Powell of being overtly racist. Farage was much cleverer than Powell, even though playing the same constituency. And everyone should remember that the Commonwealth Immigration Act, which kind of um, took away um, British citizenship from all our former colonies that, who were coming into the UK at the time, um, when <coughs> Callaghan launched that as Home Secretary, he, he raised the specter of being swamped by immigrants. It took four days for that bill to go through the House of Commons. You know, that, and all that stuff was latent. It wasn't understood. It wasn't comprehended. Um, and when um, Blair allowed everybody in in 2004, an enlargement, didn't understand the risks that were being run. Um, um, Put all that together and we have what we have. How are we going to get out of it? Um, I'll just make a few remarks and I'll stop. Um, I think uh, we, um, the operation of British capitalism is profoundly dysfunctional. It throws up these inequalities. It disproportionately favors um, our densely populated metropolitan areas. Um, and even within them um, throws up kind of some noxious inequalities. Um, we have to, have to, have to um, repurpose, revision, and reconstruct the architecture um, of British capitalism. The, 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 this little talk is called The State We're In. I mean, a lot of the stuff I wrote 20 years ago in The State We're In um, can be picked up, dusted down, refashioned um, for 20 years on. Um, but the constitution of our, of our, of our, of our capitalism um, 
the institutions that populate it, um, the banks, um, private equity, uh, all of it um, needs to be recast so that the bias is to create value rather than extract value. We have a value extracting capitalism, a perfect example of which last year was um, when Melrose, an asset stripping firm um, whose directors are paid an average of 100 million pounds a year each, um, took over um, GKN, and whose headquarters is in the West Midlands, um, and will dismember um, the company um, um, with the consequences for employment, um, kind of wages, life chances in another part of the country, which right-wing politicians can fish in for another leave vote, blaming Brussels for this, rather dynamics of our own capitalism. Um, we have to find the wherewithal um, to fund a proper social contract, um, starting with um, addressing um, people's teeth. There is nothing, nothing more painful than toothache. And if your only opportunity is to spend a five pounds on a DIY dental kit, you don't have to get angry. Um, housing, um, uh, homelessness, 11,000 people in Birkenhead depend on food banks to get by every bloody day. Of course it voted Brexit. Come on. Um, you know, we've got to get real about uh, uh, a social contract that binds and a value system that underpins a social contract, which is understanding the nature of sharing society and the reciprocity of one to another on, on which these relationships are built. We must have a constitutional settlement that actually properly decentralizes power and actually, in a sense, does um, take back control. Let's permit Mansfield, Birkenhead, Weymouth to take back control by, by having a degree of political autonomy they don't have now as actual ciphers of Westminster. A capacity to do their own taxation, their own spending, much more scope. We are the most centralized country uh, in these terms in the OECD. 5% of our tax revenues are raised locally and spent locally. That's such a gap between anywhere else, it's, it's scarcely credible. You know, most countries, local municipalities or towns have, uh, can raise 15, 20% of, kind of tax revenues expressed as a portion of the national total. Um, of course, I think that, I mean, I would actually um, reconstitute um, the House of Lords um, with uh, the um, mayors and representatives from newly empowered um, regions. I would locate it, um, not in London, but in Birmingham, um, centre of the country. Um, and, and I would do similar things um, with the Supreme Court, which I put in, Br in, in Leeds, where there's a strong and powerful legal tradition, the legal services industry is very strong there. Um, we're going to reconfigure our country, repurpose, repurpose our capitalism, and have, a, and have a social contract that works. I mean, that is part of the story um, of what we're going to do. And it's better done than the European Union and its trade relationships. Because the story of the 21st century is going to be the story of the rise of data capitalism. And it's, it's the European Union that takes on Facebook and Google. It's the European Union that finds them for the abuse of um, what's happening to your data. Um, and, in the, and, in the, and, in the, and in the years ahead, when actually so much of um, the business models of every company is going to be constructed on using our data, we are going to need protections, um, particularly as all the advantages in this new world that's emerging, the winner-take-all effects are formidable get the right technology, and you become the global giant. And who's going to actually be the countervailing power? Not little Britain playing the game of being global um, 4.0 <coughs> with Jacob Rees-Mogg as our Home Secretary, Liam Fox as our Trade Minister, and Boris Johnson as our Prime Minister. Um, they have no idea, no idea of the forces that they're playing with. So to conclude, um, um, we have to, we, there's a whole set of values that we stand for, um, a notion of Europe as a really noble cause, um, 
bringing um, our peoples who share common enlightenment values together, um, standing up for what we as a continent believe in. And by the way, there's a big damn fight for Europe's soul going on at the minute, and you, we have to join it. We need to be on the side of the of the Merkels, the Macrons, the people fighting Salvini in Italy, Vox in Spain, Orban in Hungary. Um, what a shame it is that we aren't making kind of common cause um, as, you, as the kind of populist nativist right trying to take over the European Parliament. Um, why aren't we in that continentally important fight? Um, it's a moment in time where um, kind of strong author authoritarian men, so far there's no woman, but I'm sure one will emerge, are kind of the new kind of uh, model. Um, we have to stand for a, uh, the pluralism, the kind of aki communitaire that the European Union requires of its uh, countries that join it to stand by. Um, it couldn't be a more important moment. And when and you stand and you see something like Marc Francois, uh, a Tory MP representing a constituency in Essex tearing up um, the letter from Tom Enders, the chief operating officer of Airbus, warning that yeah, with a hard Brexit, um, uh, Airbus would have to consider withdrawing all its operations um, from um, Britain. Um, saying, I am not going to be bullied by a German. Tom Enders is British, by the way. Um, um, my father landed at D-Day. It turns out his father was too young to land at D-Day. Uh, I'm not going to be bullied, and I, you know, we want a hard Brexit. There's no fear in that. And people like that have to be contested. You know, the Queen may tell the Women's Institute in Sandringham that we've got to find common cause. I have no common cause to make with Marc Francois. And... Um, and that is the nature of um, where we are in 2019. And the only thing to do is what the parliamentarians did um, in the 1640s is to actually fight and win. And fight and win. And of course, and I, uh, and I mean to fight with words and to fight with argument and, and, uh, and, and to fight with values, um, not actually with kind of pikes and pitchforks like they did in the Civil War, but knowing that actually that is the nature of kind of what we confront. Um, I don't know. Um, I fear that um, enough um, that, that the Tory party um, will swing behind Mrs May and she'll get her, her, her deal, and the prospect of getting a referendum will elude us uh, because um, Jeremy Corbyn wants to build, I mean, the idea that um, state sub that state aid obstructs the Labour Party um, from standing beside an idea of Europe is, is astonishing. But we can talk about that in the question and answer session. I am, we can maybe talk about the, the prospects, but, my, but um, uh, my fear is that um, she's going to get her deal. Um, there'll be a three-month extension while it's voted through in the European Union, and we'll have this um, unbelievably unstable halfway house um, trying to, um, around which we're allegedly going to unite in the middle of what is a de facto civil war. And um, people like me, I think, have to make the arguments that I have made. Maybe our fellow countrymen and women have to go through what the Dutch Prime Minister calls a veil of tears um, before we come out the other side. Maybe um, Britain has to kind of learn that we really are uh, a middle-ranking European power that needs to make common cause with other European powers and to hold that in our hearts um, in a way we haven't hitherto before we can make build the European Union. It may be we have to go through all that pain and grief to get to the other side. I ardently hope not, but it can't be ruled out as a risk for our times. Thank you very much. Thank you. Forty million people, the fifth of the population, are actually uh, living in uh, poverty. As uh, Philip uh, Alston, uh, the UN Special Rapporteur for Extreme yeah. uh, Poverty, right, right, yeah. uh, reminded us uh, uh, a few months ago, um, even though the Conservative Party were not prepared to, uh, to, to listen. Uh, um, and, and they have done everything within their power to discredit uh, that uh, uh, report. Uh, um,
I, I'd like to get quick reaction from uh, our panelists. Uh, we, we have uh, um, Goldsmiths Academics and, and uh, members of the Britain in, in Europe uh, think tank. Uh, just to quickly note that Britain in Europe is an independent think tank that brings together legal academics, legal professionals, uh, uh, scholars from across the range uh, of, of disciplines, uh, uh, NGO experts, human rights experts, uh, uh, business uh, uh, experts. Uh, and tonight uh, we, we, we have uh, uh, three of, uh, of our members, uh, uh, Mary Hannibal, uh, a member of European uh, 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 Parliament. Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, Michaela Benson, uh, who is uh, a reader in, in sociology. Many of you will, uh, will know her. Some might, might be her, her students. Uh, uh, we have Sir Jeffrey Nice uh, QC, who's a visiting professor in law uh, now at, uh, at, at Goldsmiths uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and a Britain Europe expert. And we also have uh, the new head of uh, anthropology here at Goldsmiths, uh, um, Professor Chris uh, So. Uh, so um, uh, I'd like to, to start with, uh, with uh, Mary, uh, Mary Hannibal, uh, uh, and just to, to quickly again uh, note uh, that uh, um, she has been a member of the European Parliament since uh, 2000, uh, um, and that was following three decades of involvement with, with Labour uh, politics. Uh, she does uh, take a special interest in, in women's uh, issues, and that would be particularly pertinent to um, culture here at, at Goldsmiths. Uh, uh, particularly the, the fact that uh, you, you're acting as the Labour spokesperson for women's uh, rights and, and gender equality. And, and tonight I think we'll, we'll be particularly interested in, in, in your wider reaction, uh, but also the view from, from Europe. Uh, how, how is all this viewed uh, from across the channel? Yeah, well, well, thank you, and thank you for the invitation here. I mean, I completely agree with virtually everything Will said. I'm not sure about the analysis of the English Civil War, but yeah. I certainly agree with everything else that you talked about, about, about Brexit um, and the reasons behind it. Um, uh, and so I, I suspect everyone from the, the panel is going to be saying the same sort of things and agreeing with what you said. Um, and I think... One of the things that that we that we haven't we didn't pick up, and a lot a lot of commentators didn't pick up before the referendum, was how we're in London, and you mentioned metropolitan cities, and it's a reflection really of the divisions in the country that we really I think didn't know much about what was going on. In, yeah. in other other regions. And I do remember before the referendum, colleagues in the European Parliament, Labour colleagues, saying, we're not sure about this. I, I was happily saying, oh, we'll win it, no problem. Colleagues were saying, well, we're not sure. We've been talking to people in... Th these are colleagues from mainly from northern regions, and, and w it's not looking as good as you think it is. And I think that was just a reflection that this country really doesn't talk to each other. I mean, we're divided in parts of the country and as Will said, we're divided in I mean, what we used to call classes. I mean, and it's got worse, I think, ra rather than better. And it has been uh, partly as a result of this government and austerity measures, um, but it's been going on for a lot longer than that. Probably goes back to Thatcher and, and the sort of extreme capitalist measures which were introduced then, and employment patterns and, and the fact, I mean, Theresa May, actually annoyed a huge number of people by talking about somewheres and nowheres um, because people who who I mean people who like like us got very fed up because we were seen as citizens of nowhere and people who who, who didn't move and, and were mobile and not mobile in the same way were also but also fed up with it and and Theresa May herself actually has got some I mean quite a lot to answer for I mean she went into this with a small majority in just the most unbelievably divisive way, saying, I've got three red lines, no single market, no customs union, and no European Court of Justice. And that was it. And the, the EU found that quite extraordinary and found it very difficult, very difficult to come up with any sort of deal because that virtually takes you out before you start. And we've got this deal that nobody likes because Theresa May would not even think about anything else, certainly not any option of discussing it with people and trying to gain consensus before she started on this. And one of the other things which this country's lost since the 1980s is some idea of consensus. 
I mean, when I first sort of got involved in politics, I mean, there was agreement across parties about a lot of the things Will's been talking about, about softening the blows of capitalism, about having a reasonable welfare state, and all those sort of equality measures. Um, and even most at the time of Edward Heath and before, the, the Conservatives, a lot of Conservatives and Conservative governments were on a different wavelength, but essentially agreed with that, agreed with having a country which is united. And that has just gone and is sadly going in Europe. I mean, Will did talk a bit about the rise of populism. What the EU was and is still is, is a very consensual... Um, organization it works on the basis of consensus I mean I just find all this business which I've been watching here because of the results of the votes in the House of Commons I find the British Parliament quite incredible now that it's so polarized the parties are so polarized and it operates like something out of not the last century but the century before and I totally agree therefore that we need to deal with this we need also to deal with the media um, Nigel Farage and the BBC, I think, were ver very much responsible for the referendum result, maybe even more so than the Daily Mail. The BBC always used Nigel Farage for anything to do with Brexit, almost always, which built up his personal profile, um, which, of course, is what politicians need to do. So he got listened to, and he was the face of everything that was wrong with the EU. And... This is our public service broadcaster, and they still do it. They still get somebody who's a, a, who is a real economic expert or an expert on something, and then in the re the, in the balance, they put someone up against them who is maybe a backbench Tory MP or somebody who really hasn't got much of a clue. And this is not balance. Balance is putting over arguments in a reasonable fashion. It's not actually negating what is in fact the case. So I think there's, there's a whole kind of, you know, the, the whole way this country operates really is, I think, crumbling. And the EU, I think, my view has been always been that the, the EU actually stopped a lot of this. Um, I, I was, as you've just heard, I, I work on, on women's rights, and most of, things like maternity leave actually came from the EU, and it's, it's debatable whether British governments would have done that. There's a whole raft of health and safety legislations, legislations which came in during the Thatcher years, which would never have happened if it hadn't been for the EU. So the EU has actually helped with a lot of this, has indeed EU money as well. Um, but sadly, it's never been enough, and there's been so, a vitriolic campaign for many, many years, as Will said, against the EU. So, you know, it's not too late. We've got to start talking about it, um, you know, and, and actually talking about what the EU does. And MEP should not just be a lone voice doing this. I think everyone on the left and everyone who cares about this country should do that. And, uh, and we've just got to get ourselves out of this mess. I totally support a second referendum, which I think is the only way, a people's vote really is the only way forward. Um, and we've just got to get this country back into a reasonable, and, and uh, it won't happen all at once, but we've got to make ourselves again a democratic country which values people, which values equality, which really doesn't have the divisions and the, the kind of society that we're seeing at the moment. Um, Mary, th thank you very much. Uh, um, we, we have uh, described uh, the, the, the powers uh, in, uh, in action uh, in this country uh, that um, basically led uh, eventually to the Brexit uh, uh, result. Uh, um, you've also described uh, how, how Europe was responsible for a lot of, uh, a lot of positives, a lot of, of progress uh, in, in this country, economic, uh, cultural, uh, social, political. But I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, and I, I'm I'd, I'd like to, to ask you, uh, Chris, I mean, was, was the EU to, to blame at all in, in, in all this? I, I know that your research has, has concentrated considerably on, on austerity, the, the impact of austerity in particular parts of, uh, of, of Europe. I mean, was, was that uh, uh, part of the equation? We have seen, for instance, how the, the Greek question uh, was migrated here and, and became a quite central uh, part of the debate on Brexit, which, which was quite ironic if you think about it, because Greece stayed in, 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 in the EU, uh, whereas uh, the UK uh, hasn't. And, and, and so if you had any reflection on this, and a wider reflection on, on the issues that have been discussed more, more generally. 
Thank you. Yeah, I, I do. I, I suppose as the anthropologist on the panel, I have this sort of insider-outsider perspective. The, the insider part, of, the outsider part of me is that I've just spent last year living in Sweden and the last 14 years living in New Zealand, which, is, which looks at Britain with a sense of growing incredulity, as, as do the, my friends and colleagues in Sweden. The insider part of me is that I used to work for the European Parliament. Um, I remember these debates really clearly in the, in the 70s and the 80s. My, my father was Peter Shaw, who was one of the leading campaigners uh, against the referendum. My godfather was Tony Benn. I knew all these characters, and I remember those debates. But this is not, and then was not now. Um, you know, I, I know the arguments put forward by the, the Eurosceptics. I know them inside out. I kind of live them and breathe them. Yeah, but right. the present context is so different. Yes, in answer to your question, I mean, you know, enlighten, we can celebrate the Enlightenment values and everything that Europe stands for, but there's a downside to that as well. You know, Europe is like, you described a, a situation which I completely concur with. Uh, I've come back to this country, I've only been back in Britain since January, and I see this damaged nation, but it's, the damage was inflicted by, well, two decades of, of you know, new labour as well as the, the, the shift towards the neoliberal policies of Mrs. Thatcher. Europe has some, something to answer for this as well in, in the, the austerity that was carried out, conducted in the name of saving you know, German capitalism. And, and it is ironic, we talk about Brexit, but that word began life as Grexit, and that was supposed to be the, the scenario, that it didn't actually happen, and Greece's forced expulsion from the Eurozone. Um, but yeah, no, I, I'd like to shift my, my key question. I want to cut to the chase. I mean, how do we exit from Brexit? And the, you spoke a lot, Will, about the problems that this is all a, a row, a kind of public school squabble amongst the, you know, the rather elite privileged groups of the Conservative Party and their Oxford days. Um, What's happening in the Labour Party? You, know, you mentioned the constitutional crisis. I, I don't think I've ever known a time in British history where there was such a, a paucity and crisis of leadership. And the constitutional crisis, yes, um, one other dimension to this is that Britain is not a country used to using referenda to make key decisions. I mean, it's a parliamentary democracy. And yet, you know, Cameron introduced this joker into the pack. Um, and now we have two conflicting definitions of the will of the people. And to hear politicians from the ERG and Rees Mogg talking about Parliament betraying the will of the people. I mean, you know, most of our, my life we've grown up with, Parliament was supposed to be the, the mouthpiece and the voice uh, of, of the people. So it seems we've got a fix. The referendum got us into this problem. Parliament can't solve it. The MPs can't. Is the only solution a second referendum, despite Owen Jones's um, arguments that this will lead to civil unrest and you know, angry farmers, mobs with their pitchforks on the street. Well, if, if you would kindly make a, a note of, a mental yeah, note of, yeah, no, of, of this, and I'll, I'll go around, yeah. around the, the panel. And, uh, but uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chris. Uh, um, M Michaela, uh, Will has uh, described uh, in, in frightening uh, detail uh, uh, the economic uh, catastrophe that is, that is looming and, and the impact that our, our companies, corporations, and our institutions more generally are going to suffer because of, of our inability uh, to you know, con continue uh, the, the, the trade deals and trade agreements that we, we used to, to rely upon. But I want to ask about people, uh, you know, freedom of movement as we knew it, um, rights that, that people used to exercise in, 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 in the previous context, uh, uh, the rights of EU citizens in the UK, and of course your, your research very much uh, relates and concentrates upon the, the rights and the situation more generally of the British uh, in, uh, in, in, in the EU, and how are they going to be affected, especially, you know, if, if we were to consider the catastrophic scenario, purely catastrophic, of, of, no, of no deal? So I think the first thing to say is that um, in, in kind of listening to Will, you kind of get this, this, this picture of some insights into some people based on some places. But once again, we find ourselves in Britain that is bound by the borders of this island nation. And probably unknowingly, and knowing to most of the people in the audience, the British diaspora is one of the biggest in the world per capita of British citizens. And yet we've heard very little about them in general. And just to give a little picture, uh, we think, and I say we think because we don't actually know, that there are between 900,000 and 2 million British citizens who live in other European countries, including Ireland. And some of those people are settled populations, they're very dispersed, um, and there are also people who are highly mobile, 
And by highly mobile, I mean seasonal workers, um, young people who, who spend maybe a summer working in one place, moving on in pursuit of work elsewhere in the EU at another time. And all you've got to do is think about the hospitality industry and how that's functioned within Europe to get a sense of that. Freedom of movement has always been about two-way traffic. So lots of British people have left Britain to go and live in the EU. And at the moment, for these people, the reality is very much that they are living in a sense of protracted uncertainty. All British citizens will lose their rights to European citizenship as of whenever we leave the European Union, the 29th of March at the moment. And this has catastrophic implications for people who are settled using those rights who suddenly find those rights withdrawn. It has implications potentially for their access to healthcare. Uh, it has implications potentially for all sorts of access to reciprocal rights, arrangements, a recognition of their qualifications. Importantly at the moment, although we have the withdrawal agreement and that secures some rights, if it comes into force, there are things that are still not secure, so continued freedom of movement within the European Union, for example, in the case of people who provide services across borders. So, so there are all sorts of, of, of issues going on there. And only today, in The Guardian, we have a report which says, in the case of no deal, British citizens who currently receive their health care through S1 entitlements, who is elderly populations who've moved to other parts of Europe, will not have that insured. There is no ring fencing of citizens' rights for these British populations who live in the, in, in the EU. Um, what that potentially means, and of course this kind of catastrophizing that happens, is that if we end up with a massive repatriation of British citizens to the UK, that will put even more um, uh, kind of pressure on a healthcare system, on a social care system, perhaps even on a housing benefit system that's currently struggling, because those will be the people who are most vulnerable among them. That type of repatriation would, would, would be uh, the case. Um, at, at that stage, we'd be talking about people who were forcibly repatriated because they couldn't afford to continue their lives as they had before. And I just wanted to point to one final point in talking about this. We talk very often around, you know, the will of the people. This is something that's already come up this evening. But which people? Who do we actually think we are? British citizens who live in the EU, after 15 years, lose, lose their political enfranchisement, which basically means that quite large percentages of British citizens living overseas in general didn't have a say in this referendum because the franchise was not extended to include all of them. So my argument would be, I didn't even realize I was gonna say my argument, but if there was a second referendum, we urgently need to have a conversation about who's actually going to be enfranchised. And I don't think that it should just be extended to British citizens who live in Europe. I think we have to have that conversation about who is here that should also be enfranchised, the 16 to 17 year olds and the EU citizens who are having their rights also renegotiated in that process. Of course, it seems we, we've never had this conversation when, when we should have uh, had yeah, it in, yeah, in the first uh, place, prior, prior to the first, uh, prior to the referendum. Uh, um, Sir Jeffrey, your, your reaction to, to all this or, or part of this, I, I know how you worried you, you are generally uh, about the direction that the country has, has taken in recent years. Well, first of all, I wouldn't want my words to mask in any way the words of will with all of which I entirely agree and which I cannot better. So I'll ask through you a few questions of him and leave it at that. Uh, I went to university 19 years only after the end of the Second World War and it's very important to recognize what sort of trajectory we've had in this country, what sort of fictions we have lived with that have actually helped us in a way but they've been fictions. We were never fully aware, rather as Will has explained, of the class-driven society in which we lived, the paternalistic and more often patronizing way in which the Tory government had its own way and we never really quite understood it. That continued right the way through until now with this extraordinary division of wealth that the poorer people do not fully understand. We started off with a fiction. Um, we didn't even think about the World War 
that had just passed in 1964. A few silly black and white films which told the story how we won, um, all on our own, I think. Um, who were those Russians? They didn't lose anyone. Uh, so we had a bit of that. Um, uh, and we carried on with that phony belief. And it's still with us now. And so I'd like to ask, um, and ask, first of all, one question of you, and then a couple of questions of will and be done. The image that has been advanced of uh, English society, and this probably won't ring true to many of you, but if any of you have watched, you may have heard me say this last week, Miss Marple on television. Have you ever watched Miss Marple on television? St. Mary Mead? It's a detective story with an old lady detective. And the image that has been sold is of uh, St. Mary Mead, Miss Marple's village, without the murders, but with capital punishment. And um, the truth is that we live in now, we live in a society of tower blocks with multi-ethnic, multi-class inhabitants, as we discovered to our immense surprise Incredible. at Grenfell. Now, if you ask either those who are gulled by the Tories or the Tories themselves, which is the society they're moving, they're hoping to return us to? Is it Mary Mead or is it the Tower Block? I know the answer. And it's a silly answer because that society never existed and it certainly doesn't exist now. Here's some questions. One, um, we all referred twice to sovereignty. Sovereignty has been flogged as something that it isn't. It existed for 200 years. It's not a natural state of uh, a country to be in. It ended, depending on your choice, at the end of the 19th or beginning of the 20th century. And yet, people have been deceived, just like with St. Mary Mead, to believe it's something to which you can cleave, whereas it's exactly something to which you should not cleave. Because we can see, not just in this country, but starting in America with Trump's determination to return us to a primitive version of sovereignty, we can see danger within and without. Because we will be made an insular island, not only looking after our own interests, but then less interested in our global responsibility. Second question, are we in fact, as a group of people stuck in this island, essentially racist and xenophobic? Because if we are, that's a really serious issue for us to look at um, and not to misuse or abuse. Third, and a uh, silly question, or maybe not, what has the European Court of Justice done to harm you? Well, I, no doubt you've heard Nigel Farage listing the cases that have been adverse to this country, or maybe not, or the foreign damn foreign judges who are hostile to this country, or maybe not. And these are among the um, errors of deception by which we have been drawn into the desperate position in which we find ourselves. And uh, my concerns include a reflection on the ease with which countries can be taken, yeah. not just into political division and strife, but worse. Mm. It's not a question of us being a nice people. We aren't a nice people. We are nasty colonialist uh, people. We are the most bellicose nation of any in the world by number of armed conflicts, more even than America since the Second World War. We just export our shooting people but we've managed to live free of being invaded. And um, so with all these uh, unpleasant thoughts in mind, perhaps I'll leave it to Will to make oh, some nice. comments.
psychoanalyst. My sister, I mentioned this fantasy that you're all drawing on and talk about being English. So there is a fantasy of being English because if you are quickly, you have it for free. It's something you have for free. And one, one way you make it more valuable is to restrict who else has access to it. That's going on at the moment. If you are English and you see English, Boris Johnson, Jacob rees mogg Roger Farage, you have got these going on, you can identify with them. And through that identification, a mechanism of identification, you can enjoy with a very real enjoyment through a fantasy, it's not a, something to be got rid of, their wealth, their lifestyle, everything, that's happening. So it's not racism yet, or it doesn't have to be seen as racism yet, it's a process of identification which produces um, the ground, which can be solidified in retrospect as racism. I actually, but can I just add that I slightly, I left my last sentence incomplete. The, we, the mechanism by which civil, un, civil political strife turns into something far, far worse can happen in any country. You only need a few elements. And actually, we have to be very careful that we don't start creating an in and out culture uh, to which you only have to add a couple of other things and you are in a downward spiral of the worst possible kind. Thank you very much. Uh, Will and, and then if there are concluding observations uh, by uh, any uh, uh, of, of other, other panelists, uh, um, please. So, well, we're losing our audience, so we better go quickly. Um, look, uh, um, gosh, uh, gosh, where to begin? How do we exit from Brexit? Um, your point about, um, I mean, I think we're of a mind in this. Um, mm. Um, room. I mean, are, are there any Brexiters here? <laughs> yeah. Um, how do we exit from Brexit? Um, uh, thank you for that question. I mean, my my. Uh, uh, while you while you were talking, I was thinking about I'm, and I I, I don't mean to be. Um, I've had my fill really of English public school boys. Um, I can't bear them, whether they're Jeremy Corbyn, Seamus Mill on the left, or Draper Rees Mogg, David Cameron, and Boris Johnson on the right. I mean, uh, I, um, they get themselves into, um, <laughs> it's a dimension of Englishness, which is, um, um, uh, <laughs> I don't want to go down there really, but I, uh, I, I have, I, 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 I've long thought that um, the two institutions that need reform above any other um, in England, uh, the City of London and the private school system. Um, and look what, uh, but anyway, that's a, the question is how do we get, how do we, how do we get to something better? Um, I, um, look, I'm a great believer um, in a democracy uh, in ultimately argument. Um, I think argument will out. Um, it was, um, I don't know if anyone watched um, question, not question time, then Andrew Neil. Um, when this um, Tory um, journalist at the Spectator, Hugh um, J James Delenpar, wasn't it, um, did a did a did a kind of mockery of all of us who think that no Brexit, a, 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 a no deal Brexit would be a disaster, and he kind of mocked us for being ghouls, and then even under fire from Andrew Neil of all people, um, he uh, self acknowledged. Kind of exposed, he knew absolutely nothing about trade, and um, he couldn't even answer simple questions. And he was exposed for being an idiot. And I mean, the and actually he he was humiliated. And ultimately, in a democracy, argument will out. So I mean, the beginnings that the beginnings of a way out of Brexit um, are actually getting the arguments straight. Um, and I and. <coughs> And then secondly, I think it's argument plus lived experience, maybe, um, that will convince, I mean, we can, uh, it'll be the lived experience, I think, of actually um, the, the next year or two that will start to change opinion. Um, so, I mean, I think there's, there's um, strategy one, 
is actually um, I'm hoping um, that uh, Keir Starmer um, in the next fortnight um, leads 220 Labour MPs out of the p parliamentary whip uh, and actually forms a major's opposition and actually marginalises Jeremy Corbyn uh, and actually leaves the, leaves the Labour Party and its money um, to him and actually um, kind of makes the case for uh, the referendum and is joined by um, enough brave Tory MPs to make that happen. Uh, now, um, is, that, is that likely? Um, tribal loyalties are incredibly big. Uh, and it, you know, and I, um, but um, uh, we, something like that may happen <coughs> if we are going to get a referendum kind of quickly enough um, to stop this process before the end of this year. Um, uh, if that doesn't happen or something like it, um, then we're going to have to kind of carry on arguing our heads off um, and have, um, and I think we're going to have to win a general election in which, you know, in the mandate for which people vote um, is going to be that um, we want to back in the European Union and we're going to um, negotiate the terms and we're going to put it to the people as we did in 1974 and 75. Um, because we, um, and hopefully the power of the argument and the lived experience um, will actually kind of turn it. But those, I mean, something dramatic has to happen in the House of Commons in the next two or three weeks, which I don't exclude. Um, or um, we have to go through this kind of veil of tears. I mean, I, I see no other way out of it. Um, and I, I um, you know, I'd be interested to hear what Mary thinks about that as an MEP. I mean, uh, wait, I mean, I, I, there are um, only 70 Labour MPs actually signed the letter calling for a referendum. I was disappointed by that. I thought we might get 120, 140. And, you know, there's a, um, again, this requires a degree of bravery, you know. Um, actually, um, it will be, there will be a lot of people who said, we voted once, why are we voting a second time? This is illegitimate and all the rest. Um, in a democracy, you know, you revisit decisions. Um, and in a democracy, a referendum is not uh, a decision for, that can never be revisited except once every 25 years. We have to be able to have a more kind of live idea of democracy. And a, a referendum, I mean, Tony Benn's idea actually put to Harold Wilson in 74, and then Harold Wilson kind of picked up and rang with it as a kind of way to get out of his problems. And it's been picked up and used by, I mean, in fairness, only Margaret Thatcher and John Major turned their face against it um, and, and stuck by Parliament as being the kind of seat of authority in the country. On your point about enfranchising um, EU citizens and um, this diaspora, look, I can't, you know, in one way, I couldn't agree with you more. Sadly, um, in proportion to the size of our population, um, we have the lowest proportion of people living outside Britain um, in the EU. Uh, we're proportionately more, actually, in the old Commonwealth countries. I was dismayed to find that number. The absolute numbers are high, I give you, but proportionately, there's much less, you know, well, there's much less penetration of uh, us in France, Germany, Spain than there is of proportionately them um, in um, the UK, to the point that actually um, London, I think, is what is it, the third or fourth kind of French city? There's a number of French living. You can't see that anywhere in, in, um, in mainland Europe. Yeah. But with that proviso, I strongly agree with you, except um, I think that the, um, I think it would be difficult to win a referendum legitimately on the votes of 16, 17 year olds and EU citizens without Farage crying foul. You know, uh, I, 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 we can probably kind of, I mean, we'll probably have to win it with the uh, those EU citizens that have taken British citizenship, of which there will be a goodly number, hopefully, in a year or two's time, and the 16 or 17 year olds who I think should be enfranchised. I think that's the way it will. Work. But if a referendum is fought in the next three or four or five months, we're going to have to do it, I think, with the same electorate base that we um, uh, that we fought in 2016 in. Otherwise, you know. It'll be seen as illegitimate. And that picks up a point from, from Mary. Um, I, I um, didn't say enough about this. And I, 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 um, there's only a few people who think like this in British journalism, and I'm one of them. But you know, 
I, I think that the um, impact of the right-wing press is underestimated um, rather than overestimated. I don't think, I mean, I, I don't think it was, uh, I think it was wrong. Um, I think the BBC did kind of fool about um, and wasn't strong as it should have been uh, in the referendum campaign, but I'm not prepared to, I mean, I really think the, the kind of agenda setting, the mood music, um, what moved opinion, um, uh, I think, um, was the Express, Telegraph, Sun, Mail, Axis, kind of moving kind of as a quartet um, in the way they did, kind of refracting and magnifying um, Farage's um, kind, of, um, kind of politics. And, and her red lines, which you correctly identified, were Farage's red lines. You know, Farage essentially took over the Tory party. Uh, he was the de facto leader of the Tory party um, in those weeks after the referendum. Um, and she got, became prime minister only because of that and, fe <coughs> and felt that his red lines had to become her red lines with all the consequences that um, we've seen. And I, you know, what, am I, what am I to say about kind of sovereignty and your, and your points? I mean, I... I um, I don't, th I mean, and here is a statement from me that um, you're at liberty to disagree with, um, but I don't think um, English culture is saturated with um, racism and xenophobia, actually. Um, I think it's, you know, this is the country of uh, Shakespeare. This is the country of, you know, Keats and, and, uh, uh, and Wordsworth. Uh, 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 our literature, our art, our culture is is actually not um, sympathetic to um, the kind of right wing politics of uh, the right of the Tory Party. Actually, um, one of the reasons why I'm to end on a high note, I'm extremely confident that ultimately um, we will um, re remake Common Cause with European partners is because the um, two things are true. There is no interest group in Britain from the trade unions through magic circle law firms via the universities into the armed services and security forces and the big companies and high tech that actually have any interest in Brexit. In a sense, you know. And secondly, and, more, and as importantly, there are no cultural foundations for it. You know, the cultural foundations uh, you know, we, we, you know, you can't, you know, the kind of um, the great speeches of Shakespeare, the great poems, the great, the great, the words we use, you know, are not um, words that lend themselves uh, to um, xenophobia and uh, and racism. I'm an optimist on that count, and because the cultural foundations are so thin, <coughs> the likelihood is that we win another referendum. And sadly, and here's the paradox. I think it was the real threat of there being a referendum, which actually um, Jacob Rees-Mogg realized that we would win, that has led him and the European Research Group and the Conservative Party to think maybe her deal is one we have to get behind because, my God, there could be a referendum and we lose the whole thing. And, uh, uh, but they will lose the whole thing. Um, and what we need, um, and here's something else that I think might happen, I think, I think in the next 12 to 24 months, as part of the remaking of our country, I think two things are likely to happen. One is, um, if Keir Starmer doesn't lead um, a couple hundred Labour MPs out of um, the current Parliamentary Labour Party under, the, uh, under this curious leadership at the minute, then there will be a new centre-left party. Um, there will be a, centre, a new centre-left party, and it will be a centre-left pro-European party, um, and it will make a powerful, it'll, it'll kind of speak the kinds of things I, I, I've said tonight. Um, and there will be, I think, um, uh, a new um, centre-right party, potentially. I mean, British politics is fragmenting in front of our eyes because the cultural foundations for the project which rees Farage and Boris Johnson wants us to make common cause with them alongside people like Marc Francois doesn't exist. And actually, what does exist must be given political expression. Jeremy Corbyn doesn't get that, neither does Ian Lavery, 
neither does um, John Thicket, neither does um, Seamus Milne. They live in a kind of cocoon of, of 19, of kind of Peter Shaw, Tony Bennett leftism, um, uh, which uh, is kind of so dysfunctional, uh, you know, uh, I mean, the, the substantive, the big substantive argument that Jeremy Corbyn has had with Seamus Milne is, was Stalin a good thing? And I have to say, I'm with Jeremy on this. He took on Seamus and said he wasn't. But what kind of world are we in when that's the kind of political discourse at the top of the Labour Party? Kind of, and, you know, they, and the Labour Party, in, its, in fairness, did try twice um, to, to kind of take the leadership off Corbyn and, and didn't succeed. Um, but that has to happen on the left. And what has to happen on the right is a parallel uh, kind of reaction against uh, the European Research Group and their domination of the Tory party. So, you know, um, there is opportunity. And one of the things I've, I, I wrote the state we're in, I thought then that we might come to the kind of, kind of change I, I argued for then. I thought we might come to it um, through an elected Labour government. Uh, it didn't happen. What may actually produce it is the crisis through which we're living. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Will. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it would be very thrilling if, if it were not so depressing, yes. I, 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 <laughs> I, I, I have to say. And, and what I retain in particular is uh, the, the point that you made about the way forward, that it's, it's the lived experience that might change the dynamics at the, at the end of the day. Uh, it brings to mind uh, something that Conor, uh, Conor Gerte, a human rights scholar, is actually saying, that he's no longer a remainer, he's a returner. Uh, he doesn't, uh, un unfortunately, yeah, yeah. unfortunately, doesn't uh, uh, see uh, the, the, the prospect of, of, of staying in within the current context. And that, you know, as you were just saying, that we, we might uh, have to, to leave, learn the lessons, and, and, and hopefully uh, come uh, back. Uh, if there are no more questions, I'm, I'm, I'm very conscious of, of the time. I would simply, yes, uh, I, I see there are a couple of, if you could make it really quick, because uh, I. So, um, very briefly, a um, question to Will. Yvette Cooper's amendment has been... Defeated by 23 votes, yeah. So I what does that mean? Does that mean uh, uh, what your suggestion about Keir Starmer, you know, being our saviour, um, does it make that more likely, uh, that that will now happen? Well, I mean, I've, I mean, you know, look, we're, <laughs> we're on the record, unfortunately. Um, uh, we, we can uh, edit, we can edit. I mean, I, look, I mean, I, you know... <laughs> Um, Stop it raises the stakes really high now. Um, the, uh, actually, I was discussing at uh, the beginning of the evening. I, I thought, uh, I mean, it's completely bogus. I mean, uh, she's not going to get, but the, I'm, I'm sure the Brady um, Amendment will get, will get passed. And what's happening here um, is that um, the Tory party, uh, sufficient Tories, are combining, I'm sure there'll be one of some Labour votes, I'm sadly, uh, here as well. Um, they want to keep no deal on the table because, um, uh, and it's a great pity that actually um, Sabine Weyrand uh, had to say um, this afternoon that there was no, no, no renegotiation of the withdrawal agreement possible. She just said that tomorrow. By saying it this afternoon, uh, she kind of strengthened the hands of the whips arguing um, that the only, um, that in order to get the European Union to climb down from that position that she outlined, you're going to have to leave a, a threat of a no-deal Brexit on the table in an event to frighten the European Union into making the concessions it said it wasn't going to make in the afternoon. You know, and, and so they've cohered around this position. Um, I don't, I'm not sure that Corbyn threw his weight enough behind Yvette Cooper's um, amendment. Um, there was backing and filling on it. I bet there were some abstentions. We'll see what the actual numbers were. Um, and I, I, you know, I, where do we go from here? Um, there will now have to be, I mean, every Labour MP uh, and, the, and the Tories around Dominic will have to, um, you know, actually look themselves in the mirror. You know, are they going to stick with the tribe? 
are either going to, are either going to kind of um, try to get the, the circumstance for the only way out now, which is the referendum. And I, as I've said, I'm not optimistic about that. Um, I'm fearful um, that actually the Europeans will give some ground. And I'm fearful that she will get her deal. And um, the second course of action that I've described is more likely to happen. So watch this space, folks. Over the next two or three years, you're going to watch a new party of the left, a new party of the right. Um, there's going to be a general election which will be won by, um, I think, the new party of the left, who's going to put to the, uh, the, the, the electorate the case for referendum to rejoin the European Union, um, which will happen because the lived experience of the next two, three, four years is not going to be a happy one. And that is how we're going to exit Brexit. And actually, in the, in, and in the act of that happening, um, the remaking of British politics will actually lead to some of the big reforms that need to happen happening in its train, because we will um, both make the case for remain, or to return, and reform the country. Sorry about that, but it's not a great way to end the evening. But given those votes, that's what I think. I, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all, uh, all our panelists, they are Goldsmiths, uh, academics, uh, uh, Mary Hannibal uh, for, uh, uh, for joining us tonight and we're very much looking forward to having a proper opportunity to hear more about your work at uh, the European uh, Parliament, uh, uh, Mary. So Jeffrey, I think, needs, uh, wants to, to add a footnote uh, to I that. I wanted to add one footnote, which is a failure, Dim uh, Dimitrios, of you and me, but it, f it reflects the franchise point. In, uh, just after the uh, referendum, Dimitrios, I, and another chap wondered what would be the position of the people who would be of voting age today, but were not of voting age then. Roughly 3% new voters who have replaced 3% of the dead. We tried with the very best legal brains in the country to see if there was any argument that could be raised on their behalf, and there is none. <laughs> And it's worth thinking about it. This is after whatever it is, two and a bit years. Supposing the process goes on for another three years, will 6% of dead have the effect of binding an additional 6% of voters? It's a very strange state to be in. Sorry, I should have yeah, I mean, it is quite very impressive that, 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 we, that we have to rely on the dead uh, to, 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 to win, uh, to win the, the, next, uh, the next referendum. That's going to be very important. That's going to be very important. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, uh, Will, and thank you to, to our audience for being with us uh, tonight. Thank you. Thank you.